Hello, everybody. It's Stephen and Walter here for another episode of So Chatty. It's been a while since you've seen us on So Chatty because, of course, you know that we've been in Australia. And both of us are sitting here now with the deadly disease, COVID. Yeah, we came home with COVID. Probably picked it up at the airport, probably picked it up on the airplane, whatever. And I have it worse than Walter has. I'm on an antiviral. Walter's just... Yeah, mine just uh, manifested itself as a head cold type of thing. Yeah. So, before I pass out, this this will probably be a relatively short so chatty today. But we have some things... Well, I say it may be short, but are they ever? Um, <coughs> and excuse me as I hack up along. Okay. Let's jump right into everything. So, we've been away. We haven't been sewing for... Well, we haven't been sewing for about four weeks now uh, because of COVID. I haven't done anything. Today's the first day I've actually sat down sort of at a sewing machine and started working on another project. But uh, more about that in a moment. But what did I plan to do when I got home? Well, I've got three quilts sitting on Lucy waiting to be quilted. And some of those are old projects, like ones I did six weeks ago kind of a deal. So I have that problem that I always pride it myself on that I was never like all those other people that had UFOs sitting in a corner waiting to be quilted. Yes, I'm with that crowd now. So that is something I'm hoping next week I will feel better to be able to get things up and going on Lucy then. Uh, other things, well, of course, I want to make an Australian quilt because if you saw uh, Idiot Quilter this week or you saw Stephen and Walter live uh, this past Sunday, we showed you the fabrics we bought in Australia. And, of course, I bought all Aboriginal prints because that's what my goal was. I mean, why go to Australia, pay $30 a meter for stuff I can get here at home for less? The Aboriginals are not so easy to get. So I had the opportunity and I'd stocked up. And uh, so I've got to find a pattern now. Um, I had one pattern in mind uh, that I thought I might do, which is actually a block that goes with a table runner. And I talked about that in the Idiot Quilter this week. But I've changed my mind on that because of something that's coming up. And I'll tell you a little bit more about it. It's going to be in the form of a teaser because it involves my, myself and the hiccups now and Stephanie. So, come to that in a minute. So, that's about what all I've got sort of hanging around in my COVID brain. Everything's very fuzzy these days. And not in a nice way. Not in like a fuzzy, fluffy kangaroo kind of way. So, what projects have you got on the line, Walter? Well, <coughs> I have some Australian fabric. I want to make a couple of shirts. I've got that. I still have a quilt that I need to finish on Lucy. Mm -hmm. And um, I had started doing a quilt for like uh, one of Stephanie's patterns, but I may leave that until my December retreat because I'm not really into quilt quilting that much. I have a few other things that I want to do as well. So I've got some more bags I want to make and stuff. So. so that's what Walter has coming up. And like the African quilt, you've seen at the top. Uh, that's what he did at the retreat in Georgia in this past December. Um, so now we got to get it on Lucy. So I'm thinking this could be a series. Walter does Lucy. Uh, and uh, I'll teach Walter how to put the quilt on, how to get it all lined up, how to use quilt path, how to pick his pattern and stuff like that. And I think I'll film it, film it, record it, whatever, come into the 21st century. COVID brain. Um, and so you guys can participate with Walter as he goes through it. And I think it might be very interesting kind of series to do because Walter is a beginner using that machine. I can show you all the same stuff, and I have uh, in previous videos, um, but... I'm more used to doing it, so there might be things that I don't really think of because I already know how to do them, whereas he'll probably come up with them and go, well, why do we do that? Or why didn't we do this? So, and then it's bound to be a comedy routine in there somewhere. 
least a lot of screaming at each other. Um, so that's a possible future thing happening here. All right. So announcements. So we're back on schedule with sewing with Stephanie and Stephen now that uh, I'm back. So that the link for it is in the show notes below. And it's the old link. The link that we always used to use before we went to Australia. Stephanie had to create a new one when we were gone. Um, so we're back to that one. So if you've got the COVID run, if you have the link that Stephanie provided while I was gone, get rid of it. It no longer works. You'll have to use the one that's in the show notes below, or in many cases, some of you copied that over anyways, to someplace safe and secure. That's what you'll be using from now on. Um, so speaking of Stephanie, Stephanie has asked me to be on her live uh, Saturday night because we're going to present a possible project that she and I are going to sort of work together on and you guys can work along with us as well. Now, we'll, there'll be more details about that on Saturday night. Um, but that's what I alluded to when I said the pattern I was originally going to use for the Australian quilt, I'm not going to use that one anymore. Hint, hint, hint. But no more about that until Saturday night, 5 p.m. Eastern Time, Stephanie's channel. There's a link for it in the show notes below. Um, and basically, Stephanie and I are going to be thinking out loud with each other, planning this because we only have a bare bones of an idea of what we want to do. So we're going to be looking for feedback from all of you as well. So that's this Saturday coming, which is, what's the date Saturday? Today's the, what, 26th? Tomorrow, 27th. Uh, now, another thing that's happening tomorrow at 8 o'clock in the morning is I will be making an appearance on Sean, the guy who sews uh, Brecky uh, live. And we're going to talk about, as we work, probably more Sean working on something than me, um, talk about Australia. Since you probably already know, Sean is an Australian. And he has lived in the States for many, many years now. But ironically or serendipitously, I'm not sure which word to use for it, we did not know this at the time, but we spent a night in his hometown. So that'll be interesting to talk a little bit about that because I don't know when the last time was that Sean was back uh, in his hometown. So yeah, I, I know he's curious to know what my impressions are of it. Uh, <laughs> it's nice. It's nice. Yeah. Um. Anyways. Well, we didn't really see that much. We didn't see that much of it. We were only there yeah, we were only overnight. there for overnight, and we went to so the uh, downtown area for a little bit, and, and it was uh, it was okay, nice. <laughs> um, <coughs> yeah, yeah. So, anyways, I'm sure we're going to talk all things Australian, and I'm not sure what. <coughs> this is why I said this is going to have to be short, because I'll cop up along, and you don't want to see that. Um, so we'll talk about, uh, you know different things. I'm sure Sean's going to ask me all kinds of questions about what I see, what I saw, what I didn't see, all that kind of stuff. Okay, so that's tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock, and there's a link to Sean's channel to the actual uh, live uh, in the show notes below. Okay, May the 4th. May the 4th be with you. Retreat, one week from tomorrow. It isn't quite full. I think there are four spots left. So, if you still want to come, there are four spots left. Um, for those of you that are already signed up for it, and I have confirmed your reservation, your registration, uh, remember that if you want to be part of the slideshow of people's favorite creations, that I need to have your picture in JPEG format no later than Monday, this coming Monday, April the 29th. Um, that's only if you wish to be included in the slideshow. It's not obligatory. Uh, but do keep in mind, I am only accepting one, pic per one picture per person. And 
uh, you don't need to write an explanation. In fact, don't bother wasting your time. Some of you have written me a paragraph telling you about when you made it in the whole bit. Guess what? I ignored it because I've said it before. All I need is your first and last name and the picture. That's it. There'll be no written explanation because this will be on a soundtrack. It'll be a slideshow. It'll go by very quickly during the retreat. Um, also, the agenda for the retreat will come out next week uh, towards the middle of next week. I'm just waiting to finalize uh, one presenter's presentation so I can add it to the agenda. And once I have that, then, yeah, you'll get it too. And in that email, not only will it be the agenda, but there'll be the uh, Zoom links for both the retreat itself and for the night before, the Friday night, we always have an icebreaker cocktail party which is always lots of fun. And it gives an opportunity for people, especially people who've never been to one of my retreats. You might be a little shy about what goes on. Well, join the icebreaker cocktail party. You won't be shy anymore. So that's on the Friday night. So the links for both of those will be in what I send out next week to everybody. There'll also be a link for my brand new second uh, quilt pattern. Um, I've been sitting on this until the retreat date came up. So people that signed up for the retreat get first dibs at it. It's absolutely free. Um, are we going to be working on it during the retreat? No, we are not. It is not a so long, uh, quite frankly, because there's so much I have to do to keep things running that day. There's no time to do a so long as well uh, with it. However, if you wish to work on it during the retreat, there's nothing stopping you from doing that. And I have had some people ask me, is this a project-based retreat? It is not. It is work on whatever you want to work on. And plus we have the guest speakers. I think I've mentioned to you who the guest speakers are before. I have Stephanie from Stephanie Stitches. I have Shannon from Slay Arts. And I have Adam from Adam Sews. Uh, they're going to be showing you uh, a project that you can make on your own time. It is not a sew along. It's a demonstration uh, for that. But that'll be there it'll be very easy for you to um figure it out as things go on and looking at their topics this isn't just your let's sew a block or let's do some paper piecing there's a lot more to each one of these so you will not be disappointed i hope no um okay i think that's all i need to tell you about the retreat all right, another event coming up, May the 8th, the social review. Uh, there's a link for it in the show notes as well. Hopefully this time, if you remember the very first one we did, I was hosting it and I had a little technical difficulty. Well, Stephanie sat down with me the other day and I think I've got it figured out now. So there shouldn't be a problem. Cross my fingers. <coughs> Cough up a lung. Okay. So, that's on May the 8th, 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time on the Idiot Quilter Channel this time. We host every other, every month. We switch the host. Okay, um, plans for future series. I did a little survey with the people that were at uh, the Sewing with Stephanie and Stephen the other day to see what they'd like because everybody seemed to like the machine embroidery series. Um, so I thought, well, this seems to, people seem to like things that are in a series. So what else can we do? Well, I've already mentioned the fact about Walter learning how to use Lucy. Um, but another thing that came up was AccuQuilt, how to use AccuQuilt, how to cut fabric efficiently on an AccuQuilt in the proper way, um, how to translate an existing pattern to take advantage of AccuQuilt. And there are some times when you don't want to use AccuQuilt with some patterns, uh, but others where, yeah, it does. Um, little tips and tricks about that, the dyes, all that kind of stuff. So I'm going to develop that into a series. Uh, and I'm not sure when I'll have that ready to go. I'm hoping next week I can do the first, first one. Um, but stay tuned. If you have any suggestions for things you'd like to see here on So Chatty channel that you think we could explore further, 
um, within reason. Okay. Uh, we don't do tutorials, sewing tutorials. Okay. Um, but if there's something, you know, that you want to know more about that you think we can help you with, then put them in the comments below, send me an email and we'll see what we can develop for future COVID brain is the word I want. Future programs. Okay. COVID brain is a real thing. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Like, how da? What are you doing? You're making a little squeegee noise. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Squishy. Is your nose bothering you? Yeah, sometimes. Yeah. Oh. Bothers me every time I look at it. Yeah. Put on your glasses, Mr. Magoo. Yeah. Okay. So. You got yours on. Uh. Okay. okay, today's topic. You noticed in the in the title it said could be a stupid idea. We just came off of doing that whole series on everything you ever want to know about machine embroidery and then some, right? We gave you tips and tricks. We gave you warnings and things like that. But obviously not everybody saw those that series. And there is a group on Facebook that I belong to which is the Genomi 550E Embroidery Machine Users Group. And this is where people share their projects of what they've been working on, but more so they share their problems, which is great because there's lots of people there to give you a hand with things. Everybody has a different level of expertise. Um, everybody's learning all the time. So nothing wrong with that. Except, mm -hmm. except when people start giving you the wrong advice or, uh -huh. or, or not necessarily advice that are good things how do you put it gently they give you stupid advice where this comes from i don't know now i'd like to say this comes from the generosity of their heart yes and that probably does but when you go to a user group any user group for any product i mean i belong to several different user groups for different things like i belong to a 3d printing one and there are some really stupid suggestions on that for how to fix problems and what i have found in all the user groups i've been in is that sometimes the help is worse than the problem it just lends itself to possibly more problems or even some disasters serious disasters so um were you going to say something about in that too from what your experience <laughs> yeah, like uh, there's some advice that's on there that I don't really agree with. Like, I mean, okay, it's people thinking out of the top of their heads or people starting to use their machine for or attempting to use their machine for something other than its intended purpose. Yeah. Right? And so. And the thing, too, is, okay, you've got to take what anybody tells you with a grain of salt, even what we tell you. We are not experts, but we've had a lot of experience over the last... Well, not only that, you have to sort of have an idea that if you're really... If somebody has said something on one of these user groups and you're a little unsure about it, either do some more research mm -hmm. or take that as a precaution. Yeah, don't just leap into what anybody says. Because it, it, some people, the way that they will voice their advice will make it sound like this is absolutely the best way and the only way to fix that problem. And they sound like an expert and it's the tone that they write in. They might just be thinking out loud, but it's their writing style. Well, no, that it may also be things that they've thought of doing, but never did. Yeah. And, uh, so. or they've heard somebody else do something. So they've done that. And how many times have you actually said, Oh, I really am looking at looking at purchasing this machine. What's your opinion on it? Oh, I have one of those and it works great. All this other stuff. You get it home, it doesn't work good for you. You go back to this person and say it's, oh, it's not working good for me. Oh, yeah, it doesn't do that good for me either. There's omissions in some of this advice. Uh, either because the person, well... I don't want to say anybody was doing that deliberately to screw somebody up because I don't really think that's the case at all. I think they just forgot to say something because for them, it's just second nature. But, you know, it's not second nature to everybody because, again, we're all at different levels when it comes to using this, this specialized equipment. 
Uh, it's a specialized set of skills that you develop over time. Um, also, sometimes people use the wrong words for different pieces that are on it and get people really confused. In fact, I'm going to talk about an example of that in a moment. So it's very easy to, because you're desperate, you want it fixed, you want it fixed now. I know that feeling because that's exactly how I am. I am very impatient. I'm having a problem. I want a quick and dirty fix for it now so I can move on with what I want to do. So I will read something and I may take it at face value if I don't sit back and think for a moment because it's dangerous. It can be dangerous. So let's give you an example of what we're talking about. Okay. Somebody was having a problem with their foot, their presser foot on their embroidery machine. And we're talking about the 550E right now, because that's what we know. Uh, catching on a quilt. They were trying to quilt a quilt on it. Or they wanted to be able to embroider on the base, on the bottom of a rope bowl they had made. You know, the rope bowls are real popular right now. But they're thick. But they're thick. And, you know, rope bowls, for example, are made out of clothesline rope. And clothesline rope is not one standard size. I know this because I bought some because I was going to give it a try. I haven't got to it yet. But I was a little confused when I went on Amazon to buy it because there was, I bought something that said it was 7.30 seconds. But some videos I, were, I was, was, COVID brain, I was watching said that they used 3.16. Okay, do the math. 7.30 seconds is basically 3.5 sixteenths, okay? So it's close. But there's also quarter inch and even thicker than that. Your machine, your foot, can't handle anything that's thicker than a quarter inch. In fact, should be a little less than a quarter inch. Uh, with that. I've read an eighth of an inch, but I don't know. Oh, an eighth of an now. inch? Hmm. Drop the, drop the foot. Yeah, it's uh, more than, no more than a quarter. I think. Yeah. I think a quarter you're pushing it. Yeah, you're pushing it at a quarter. We're just looking at the foot right there. So people want to know, well, how do I get around that? How can I adjust the foot so it's up higher and it won't catch? You can't. That's the, that's the first thing. That's a limitation of your machine. Yeah. But they found a workaround. Beware of hacks. I'm going to show you the workaround. A little picture of it up here. There it is. This comes from Amazon. It is a metal open toe free motion quilting embroidery pressing foot for Brother Singer Genomi domestic sewing machines. Okay. Now, the word that jumps out is embroidery but that's not the word that should really jump out the phrase domestic sewing machines should be what you focus on but people haven't been focusing on this this is the foot that is designed for free motion quilting now they put in their embroidery a domestic machine does not embroider a domestic machine does decorative stitches. Even the alphabet set that may come in with your domestic machine is not technically an embroidery file. It is a series of decorative stitches to make the letters. <coughs> it is not machine embroidery. But people think, oh, if they get this because the foot hops, it's got a spring in it, you see. And with free motion quilting, uh, that's meant to do that because you've got a quilt underneath it. And so you want, you have, you know, rises and falls in the quilt. So this kind of compensates for that. It bounces up and down uh, with it. But you can't put that on your Janome 550E. Maybe other embroidery machines come with something like this. But as far as Janome's concerned, 
This doesn't. There is only one other foot, isn't there, that you can yeah, buy? Yeah, there's only one other official foot that you can buy, and that's a couching foot. Yeah. And if you don't know what couching is, look it up on Google. Uh, so, because we're not going to talk about it today. But that's the only two feet that you can get. The one that came with your machine and the couching foot. Anything else that you put on there is, or try to put on there, is not an official foot. Yeah. So, how, first of all, you would be able to screw this on, looking over at my other one right now, yeah, that's not going to work. There's no place for that to be able to screw that on, which I didn't see anybody talking about that. Yeah, uh, but they made it sound like this was the solution. However, also in that user group, I didn't hear one person say they had actually done it yet. They had heard, remember what we said about hear, uh, hearsay? They'd heard you could do this. And then somebody said, and this one's just a killer. Um, my husband has a Dremel. He thinks he can make it fit. What are you going to do with the Dremel? A Dremel is a drilling and cutting tool. What the heck are you going to cut? Probably somehow he's uh, going to modify it so that it will screw onto the machine. Yeah. No. Talk about, first of all, violating your warranty. Well, not only that, you could end up causing some serious damage to your machine. And worst case, you know, your needle might end up hitting that, uh, what do you call it, the foot plate. Your, uh, and when that happens, it can throw your timing out. Mm -hmm. And once your timing is out, that is very difficult to uh, fix that, especially on an embroidery machine. Like, quite frankly, your, if your timing goes out, you're fucked. There's no two ways around it. You cannot fix that yourself unless you're a licensed sewing machine mechanic. And if you live with someone that is that, you don't need any advice from anybody. You've got it built in right there. Um, it's going to cost you a lot of money to fix it. Not only that, it presents a danger to your physical well-being. If that needle doesn't go down the hole the way it's supposed to because you've altered this foot or whatever and it breaks off, that piece of needle can go anywhere at the speed of a bullet. It can get in your eye, get in your cheek, Stab your little dog or cat that are sitting nearby. Okay. Um, yeah. No, not a good idea. But here is a really good example of people looking for hacks when there isn't a hack for Yeah, it. like if you want to embroider on something that's too thick, then why not just embroider a patch? You know, like a, 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 on a piece of cloth or something and cut it out. And adhere it with uh, with uh, with uh, a tacky fabric glue, glue, fabric glue, something like that. Yeah, that would be a lot easier. Also, to embroider on a rope bowl, you want to make sure you'd have a really sharp needle. Now, there is something, and I haven't been able to find it again. I saw a video, and it was on one of the sites where you purchase uh, your files for embroidery, and they showed a video of someone doing this, embroidering on the base. But I never watched the whole video and I didn't listen to it or read it to see what they were talking about. Actually, I had thought of trying to do another search today to see if I could find that. Um, so I think that company is doing dirt for people because maybe they know what they're doing. Or maybe they're doing it on an industrial machine. It could be something like that or whatever but um yeah now if you look at the description of this device that's here i can see how people would immediately think oh wow great i'm going to order this because it has the word word embroidery embroidery presser foot well they're labeling it wrong they should not even be using the word embroidery in there but I can see when you're desperate and you want to do this thing and you this looks like a solution because somebody suggested it and find it here. Oh, yeah, I'll use that. No. Good thing it's only $11.39. In fact, I have a foot that looks like that, 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 that's, that came with my yeah, sewing machine. Me too. 
And this one's a cheap one. At $11, yeah. you, you know it's not an original. It works. It's a it's a third party yeah. piece of crap. Um, you know, it's probably made in China. Well, so is our sewing machines probably. But uh, I mean, it's not. But if you notice, if you study this a little bit more and go over where the pictures are, down here, it shows you from different angles what it looks like. You see, it's that spring part there that people are so excited about because it makes the, the foot bounce up and down. Well, so, it makes the foot be able to go up higher than a quarter of an inch. Yeah, but it doesn't stay up there. No, I know that. But if you look at your embroidery foot, it bounces up and down too. Yeah. But, yeah, it bounces up and down, but it's being pulled up and down. Yeah. That the way this is designed is it's sitting on your quilt in your domestic yeah. machine. And because the quilt's thicker, it has this yeah, play. Yeah. It adjusts yeah, yeah. size. Yeah. But you can't put that. Take a look at the way it, it yeah. goes on. It fits totally different on the domestic yeah. sewing machine than it does on the embroidery yeah. machine. It's not going to work. And uh, see, see, they... Says fits most low shank brother singer baby lock janome kenmore euro pro and etc sewing machines sewing machines the operative words here are sewing machines your uh, embroidery machine may look like a sewing machine but it's not a sewing machine no. it's an embroidery machine so you got to really think about this kind of stuff and then you see they're sewing, showing it all being used on a sewing machine all the diagrams. There is nothing here showing you that this would work on an embroidery machine. Don't even go there. But that's how how easy it is for people to get led down the garden path. Because these people on here were all excited about it. And they even got people excited about the Dremel. Because one of them goes, I think my husband has a Dremel. Oh, God, honey, no. No, no, no. Are you in the market for a new uh, embroidery machine? Because you will be. You let your husband at that with his Dremel. Yeah, next thing you know, your regular embroidery is not working anymore. So Yeah. So don't do stupid things. That's a stupid thing. Okay. So here's another thing. And this comes down to use your embroidery machine for what it was intended to be used. Not for what it's not intended to be used. And this, this is a problem with the manufacturers right now. Uh, some of them are trying to suggest to you that you can embroider, and you've heard me say this before, quilt, quilt a whole quilt, queen size quilt on your embroidery machine. I'm sorry, I am very much convinced of my opinion from based on experience. You cannot, you cannot, not effectively. And it's going to give you more headaches than not. But, there are solutions, more hacks. Somebody said, oh, well, I was trying to put this th item. She didn't say it was a quilt. Um, this item into my hoop and it, my hoop just kept springing out. It wouldn't stay in the hoop. When I'd get it on the machine and start to embroider, it would pull it out of the hoop. It would pop out of the hoop. So what, to, what should I do? Well, there's been many suggestions. Binder clips, you know, binder clips, the ones that, uh, you know, they're black. I have the little prongy thingies up. Do I have one sitting here? No, I don't. Actually, I do. Reach down the bottom drawer. There's a drawer full of them. I love binder clips, but not for embroidery. That's a binder clip. Okay. Yes. They're heavy duty. You open it up. You put it down across your frame. Put a bunch of those around. Yeah. Nothing's going to move out of that sucker. You know, yes, they will. Oh, yes, it will. It feels tight, but the tension, if it pulls up, you got a bird's nest, it'll pop. But the worst part about these is you can bend your frame. You can crack your frame. You break your frame. You know how much a new frame costs? You can't crazy glue it. Well, and not only that, if it tugs too much, you could actually cause damage to your embroidery arm. Yes. And that's a major repair. Major, major repair. Probably I'll set you back almost as what how much the machine itself cost. So, yeah. Other people suggest heavy-duty magnets. I'm not really sure how you use the heavy-duty magnets. But, you know, I think there are people trying to imitate the magnetic hoops that are available uh, in some way. 
Mm, not a good idea because if those magnets come loose while you're embroidery and flip into underneath your needle or in around again cause a problem and then there's good old-fashioned masking tape or any kind of tape why why that's not solving your problem in fact here's your problem what you have is too big for your hoop your hoop is designed to handle a certain amount of thickness after that it will not listen to the hoop don't be forcing it don't be trying to make it do what it can't do because it's going to give you grief with it redesign your project rethink your project why do you want something that thick in your hoop anyways i can see people trying to do a bag in a hoop a quilted bag or a bag that's got you know already got uh you know it's stabilizer in it you know soft and yeah well what you should be doing is if you make the bag yourself you should uh embroider the panel first and then uh, uh incorporate it into your bag yeah don't, don't don't try and embroider the bag after you've put it all together yeah because that's not that's going to be too thick for it now having said that i have done it i have done it with the except like a panel of the bag yeah i, I had a, a quilt sandwich basically but i use something called uh, i used a very thin <coughs> uh interfacing or batting actually i use something called uh battleizer which is much thinner than your it doesn't have as the loft that you have in regular batting and i don't I had already quilted this I was just adding the design to it. So the quilting had been done already on my Lucy, on my long arm. And um, so it's already flat. And it's stayed in the hoop. So I well, knew that it was okay. Well, I mean, there's other things that you can do to put it, keep it in your hoop too. Like you could do a basting stitch around uh, around your design yeah. and stuff like that. But um but the what I'm envisioning is somebody's got this great big huge project like a quilt, and <coughs> your hoop has to move back and forth mm -hmm. for it to uh, to. So when you've got the weight of something like a quilt or something, and it's pulling this fabric back and forth on on the thing, so you, your your hoop is bending, and your your um, and there's strain on the arm, and there's strain on the arm. You can eventually cause some major damage to yeah. your machine. So. If it's too thick for the hoop, it's too thick for the hoop. Rethink your design. Okay. Um, now, somebody was asked a question, a legitimate question. Is it worth buying a five spool thread holder? That you, you can get this as an option for the Janome 550E and it mounts onto your machine. I have one, you've seen mine, and it'll hold five spools of thread. I have one that <laughs> holds two spools of thread. Yeah. Now, what's the advantage of one of those? Well, you can organize your threads in advance of starting your project and you can have your first five colors that you're going to be using already there, ready to go. You can only thread one at a time still, but they're there ready to go yeah but you're also your stand is also orienting your thread cones to be vertical yeah as opposed to using your horizontal um thread feed for that comes with the machine yeah and there's advantages and disadvantages to having your thread vertical as opposed to horizontal it depends on a lot of how the thread a thread is wound uh the type of thread it is and things like that but generally speaking for the Janome 550e users the machine only comes with the horizontal pin. So, yeah, after a while, when you've got a lot of thread changes, having to take the thread off, put another one on, thread it again, that's all time consuming and it tends to be tedious. You're still going to have to thread each one of these threads on a stand separately, but it's a little more efficient with it. But what this person uh, was concerned about is, you know, what happens when the th with the threads that are hanging on the top because you have the bar that has these places for the thread to hang down from 
she's afraid that they're going to fall down and get caught up in the mechanism of her machine. And that is a very legitimate worry. I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, I use mine all the time, my, my thread stand. Um, and uh, I just cut my thread short enough that they're hanging over the edge, but they're not touching the machine. And I do keep my eye on it because the vibration of the machine can, you know, make them fall down. Uh, and you don't want that. Or you can also take a, a little clip or something and just clip them to the rail at the top. I've done that as well. Um, so, yeah, I think they're really worth the money to invest in one. However, some people don't like to spend the money. They like to have a hack. And, you know... They look around their kitchen and decide that there's something in their kitchen they can use for this, like a coffee mug. So one lady, she, she says she puts, and this is, I am reading this exactly as it was written, okay? The writing is horrible, so I hope you can make sense of it. I use a single stand, put my thread in mug, run, thread, the stand, then over to machine. I would never use multiple. The threads can wrap around the hand wheel, get sucked in the vent of the machine. Has happened to me. After deciphering this code message, <coughs> I've come to the conclusion that she got a coffee mug. She puts her spool of thread in the coffee mug and sort of like a an, ex, uh, an extended thread stand and then threads her machine with it. Okay. That would work because essentially... If you have a standalone thread stand for a single one, and I have one sitting next to my machine uh, that I use all the time, um, it's kind of the same purpose. The only problem is in a coffee mug, you do not have a extended rod that goes up. Like, just hand me that. Hopefully it won't fall off. Here, you hold it up. No. So this is what I'm talking about. This is actually a dual one. It's got this bracket up here. So you run your threads up over that and then you thread it through your machine. And you see, this is telescopic. So it pulls up, goes down. So I have it at the same level as the base of the, of the top of the machine. And so it very neatly threads right along where it's supposed to go. If you're using a coffee mug, coffee mug's this high, your spool of threads in there, thread's going to come out right from there it's going to have to run up the side and over and down and around and there's many places it can get caught you can also get caught into your machine as one person has already said here and let me explain to you what they're talking about the flywheel you know the wheel that's on the side of your embroidery machine that raises or lowers the needle manually that's spinning while your embroidery machine is going it's spinning it's part of the motor system right if <coughs> you get a length of thread gets close to that and somehow gets caught it'll get wound inside all around the inside sprockets of that wheel you are not going to get that undone yeah you you do have to be able to take your machine completely apart and that's next to impossible so. yeah that's going to make a mess so even if you're using a standalone thread stand like we just showed you you want to keep it away from that part of your machine. Make sure it has clearance. There's another little thing that I'm going to tell you about that happened to me, and it was a completely freak accident. On the top of the Janome 550E, there is a bobbin winder. Now, I never use my bobbin winder because I have pre-wound bobbins for mine. But there is a little gap between the spindle that the bobbin goes on, the bobbin case goes on, or bobbin holder, and the little mechanism that keeps the thread moving around it in a nice, even fashion. <coughs> There's a little space that goes down inside the machine in there. I had a thread break one day. And who would have thought? My thread broke, it flew up, came down, dropped right down into that little hole while the machine was running. Yeah wrapped itself around the mechanism in the inside of that machine. There was no way that I could unwind that myself. I took it into <coughs> Yeah, I looked the at it. There's no way I was able. You had to take every panel apart in that machine 
to be able to get at that spot. So since I never used the bobbin winder, what I've done now is I've taken a couple of pieces of masking tape and I've covered over that little hole. It was a freak accident. You would never thought that that would ever happen in a thousand years, but being me, it would happen and it did. So yeah, you got to make sure, bottom line here is make sure how your thread is going into your machine. The pathway is clear. It's not going to run into anything and get caught up on it. Okay. <coughs> so I'm not really saying that this idea of using a coffee mug is necessarily dumb, but just beware. I still think it's worth it. And they're not that expensive. It, yeah, it's worth it to get uh, a regular uh, manufactured thread stand. They're yeah. not expensive. They're not expensive. You can pick them up for I under mean, they're probably bucks. cheaper than a coffee cup. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So... And just as an aside note to that too, if you do buy one of those ones that, that are the external, uh, they don't attach to your machine or standalones, make sure they're weighted. And it's best to find out how much weight they have. Yeah, and plus they're good for <coughs> holding large cones. Yeah, that kind of thing. Okay, here's one. We have talked about this before, but people still aren't getting the point, I guess, at least in this user group. Bobbin tension, adjusting it. What I mean by that is... Or even a machine tension for that. Or matter. machine tension, yeah. Um, but in your embroidery machine, it's got a bobbin case, right? In the case of the Janomis, there's the yellow, there's the red, sometimes blue. Don't usually use the blue. Yeah. Um, and... There are people out there telling you, oh, if you're if you're you're seeing your bobbin thread or whatever it's coming up or it's whatever onto it, just pull this out and there's a little tiny screw on the side and just give that a quarter of a turn, put it in, see if that fixes your problem. If it doesn't fix your problem, give it a quarter turn the other way, see if it fixes your problem. If it doesn't fix your problem, give it another couple of quarter turns. No. Do not touch that screw unless you are a qualified service technician. Yeah, because because anybody that does that also really needs a secondary measurement to test that that case out. Yeah, there's a, a special tool for testing the tension on that you can buy, um, and they're they're not even they're kind of hit and miss. If you don't know, know what you're doing, then yeah, no, like I mean, I've had the bobbin thread come up before, but it's always been a threading issue for me um like a, a top thread issue or a bottom thread issue i had to rethread it or uh, on a couple of times i had to clean out my bobbin underneath and give it a little drop of oil underneath and that's fixed it type of thing it's always been a threading issue now there will be people that will argue with us there will be somebody on there i have done this a thousand times it works great i just get i have a little screwdriver it's going to fit in there and i just give it a little quarter turn and everything's just fine well guess what it's fine for that project next project comes in different dynamics different types of stitches yeah, so once you start adjusting that bomb case you're going to have to start adjusting it for everything for project. everything you do right and you're going to have and you're going to end up bitching that your machine's not working because Every time you do a project, you got to adjust the bobbin case. Yeah. So don't do it, regardless of what anybody says to you. Now, I noticed in this user group, somebody said that their machine technician at the store they got their machine said, don't ever touch that tension. So this came from an expert. And I've heard that from other experts before, too. Don't touch the tension with it. Again, we talked about this in one of our part of our series, and it goes back to the old days of sewing machines when tension was a thing you had to adjust. It didn't have auto tension. They weren't as precise as they are today. They didn't have the computer components. But that's a sewing machine, again, not an embroidery machine. And I wouldn't touch the tension on my sewing machine either. Yeah, especially the bottom. <coughs> yeah. So like Walter says, if you're having a problem, if you're seeing your bobbin thread coming up, then you re-thread your machine right from the start. Take it all out, unthread it, and re-thread the bobbin as well. And make sure you're threading it properly, too. Make yeah. sure your machine on top. A lot of people miss the uh, 
the little loop at the top or whatever for uh for uh there's a special way that you have to thread your machine um and that's maybe a little different than a sewing machine yeah and uh if you miss that little loop at the top then it, it, it your tension may not be proper yeah so you know if you need to refresh your memory grab your manual always know where your manual is and and double check with that but unthread it and clean it and if you do buy one of those thread stands at the back there's a little piece of uh the an, another guide that goes through that you have to put yes. your uh, thread through yeah it'll come with don't throw it out i remember shirley at ultimate sewing saying to us one day a lady bought the thread stand that i have and she found this little metal piece that came with it this little eye kind of a thing she says i don't know what that was for so i just threw it out and shirley looked and i went no there's a spot on the top of your machine you got to put that in because that's part of the threading with those yeah so yeah so if you've got a little metal piece that comes with your spool stand don't throw it out look at the diagram to figure out where it goes because it's important that you'll have problems with your with your tension because you didn't thread it right okay so there was something else that you said oh about orafil <coughs> oh some lady uh on there which i didn't comment to asked about oh can she use orafil thread for embroidery well technically you can use pretty much any thread um but uh, some of your some threads your machine will like and some won't right um but I was questioning, why would you use Orfil thread? Other than the fact that you may have a whole pile of colors of Orfil or whatever. But Orfil thread is an expensive thread to be using for embroidery. Plus, it does not have a sheen on it no. like the embroidery threads usually have that uh, you get. Most embroidery threads nowadays are polyester threads. And they have a nice shine on them, yeah. right? Plus, they're much less expensive than using Orfil thread. Yeah, because I use Floriani, as you well know. And my, Floriani is about six ninety nine a spool. Orafil thread is eighteen dollars a spool. And the uh, Orafil thread has a little bit more on the spool, but uh, it's not significant enough, right? And the number of colors that you would need for a decent project. Yeah. On a lot of embroidery, you take out a second more mortgage. Than, yeah, it's more than. Uh, uh, well, I don't know if you get the ones that I do. It they're like twenty eight different colors, so try and buy 28 different spools of Orifel thread. Yeah. At $18 Canadian a pop, you do the math. Um, so, yeah. Um, again, when I hear questions or when I hear people make comments like that, uh, what it is is they're cheap. I have all this thread. I uh, Why should I buy more thread? I'll just use this thread. It's like what we said about using stabilizers. Stabilizer is expensive, but don't crap out on it. Don't try to get away with one layer when you need at least three uh, for it because your thing's going to come out rotten and you'll throw the whole thing out. So where's where did you save your money there on that one? So yeah, so those are some of the things just as kind of a way to finish off our whole series on uh, machine embroidery. Yeah, be careful what you, if you, I mean, it's okay to look at one of those uh, Facebook groups, uh, 550E. You might learn a few things on yeah. it. Yeah. But be wary about what some of the advices that people are giving to uh, to other people. Because remember, those groups are run by amateurs, just like us, like anybody else. Everybody has an opinion, right? Um, so, you know, you've got to carefully weigh what you read. And if you feel that this isn't right, that this could cause a problem, don't do it. Because you're probably right, it will cause a problem. And then you're going to regret it. And who are you going to call then? Right? Okay. So, that's it for us today. Unless Walter has any parting wisdom to give her no wisdom. No. Wow. I'm speechless. Um, so have a great weekend, uh, embroider something pretty, but do it wisely. And, uh, we'll see you next week for another episode of So Chatty. Say goodbye, Walter. Goodbye.